Hello everyone, thank you so much for being here today. I'm delighted to kick off this challenges, it's challenges, challenges Grand series, challenges. Grand Challenges series. Um, I, I think that there is perhaps no, well, there have been a lot of challenges in American history, Civil Wars, World War II, but creating the presidency from scratch, what that meant, what it was supposed to do, uh, is, is a, a truly unparalleled challenge, especially when we look at the Constitution and Article 2, which designs the presidency, is really, really quite short. There are very few words there. It doesn't really say what the president is supposed to wear, what the president, how the president is supposed to talk to people, how the president is supposed to interact with other branches of government. How is the president supposed to interact with citizens? These are all some of the questions that Washington had to grapple with. So my goal for today is to sort of walk you through how Washington started to grapple with the biggest challenge, which is how do you make decisions as a president and what his approach to this very organic challenge was, and then how it has sort of contributed to our understanding of the presidency over time. I am gonna leave a couple of minutes at the end for questions. It's always my favorite part because I want to know what you want to know about and I want to give you that information. So please jot those down so that we can have a little discussion at the end before we get you out for your next class. So any conversation about the presidency has to start with the Constitutional Convention. Washington was the president. He is, of course, the most noticeable person in this painting. He is the tallest. He's on the raised dais at the front, and he attended every single session. He did not miss a single working day the entire summer, even when it was hot and disgusting in Philadelphia and there was no air conditioning and they had to keep all the windows closed so that no eavesdroppers could hear their conversations in the room. He was very clear about what the delegates' expectations were, what their fears were, what their hopes were for the presidency. He had been paying very close attention because he knew that if this experiment worked, if the Constitution was indeed ratified, that he was going to be the first president. There was no question. Everyone understood, which must have made the conversations at the convention quite a bit awkward, given that he was sitting in the room and staring at them. But none, so nonetheless, he was paying attention when these things happened. And there were really three big fears that the delegates were grappling with when they were thinking about what the presidency should be and what they were trying to avoid. We so often make the mistake of segmenting American history into the early republic or the years basically after the ratification of the Constitution and the revolution. When in reality, the people who were there, these guys, most of them had either served in the military or they had served in the revolutionary state and congressional governments. So they were creatures. They had been formed by this process. So the first of the big three fears was the British cabinet. Most Americans initially blamed the cabinet for starting the revolution. They referred to the redcoats as parliament's troops not the king's troops, parliament's troops. And they believed that there was this group in the king's cabinet that had all the power, that made all the decisions, that were whispering in his ear, but it wasn't clear who was in that group or who really had influence or who was saying what. There was no transparency. There were certainly no minutes taken. And so they were, the Americans, when they got into the Constitutional Convention, they really wanted to avoid a cabinet system like this one. They wanted to make sure that whoever advised the president, it was very clear who they were, it was very clear who said what and who advocated which policy, and they wanted to make sure the right people were advising the president, so safe, experienced advisors. That was fear one. Fear two. Most of the delegates at the Constitutional Convention, indeed most of the founding generation, were students of history, which as a historian I applaud. But they were students of history, they were very aware about what had come before, and they were particularly keen on English history. Now the Constitutional Convention took place in 1789. Oliver Cromwell, who's pictured here, who sort of spearheaded or led the English Civil War and then took on powers really as a dictator, died in 1658, so only 130 years earlier. 
Right now on HBO, there's a show called The Gilded Age about American history 130 years ago. We still talk about the Civil War all the time, and that was far longer than 130 years. So this was nothing to them. They were very aware of what happened, and they wanted to make sure that whatever institution they created, it needed to be powerful, but it couldn't be too powerful. It couldn't be such that the weaknesses of men would allow them to seize it and turn it into a monarchy. Now that third fear was of mob rule and anarchy, kind of the exact opposite. So on one hand, they were really concerned about one person having too much power. And on the other hand, they were concerned about what happened if no one had too much power and the American people could sort of form a mob and shut things down and be super violent. And this was something that was very much on top of mind because just a couple years earlier in Massachusetts, a group of rebels under the leadership of Daniel Shays, who had been a Revolutionary War veteran, closed down all the courts to protest a taxation measure. So the very thing that they were really concerned about had just happened a couple years prior. So with these big three fears in mind, they crafted a presidency that was trying to find that middle balance between not too powerful, but powerful enough. And they included two very important options for the president's advisors. First, they included an option for a council of foreign affairs. And second, they included an option for written advice. Notice, there's no mention of a cabinet, there's no mention of a council, there's no mention of a special elite group. And the delegates explicitly rejected those proposals, including one that looked almost identical to the cabinet that ended up being created. They rejected it outright. They were, as I said, reasonable men. They understood that these advisory options were required. No one person can make all of the decisions or have all of the answers. And of course, the president was going to need advice. So the first thing that they did was in Article 2 place a clause that says the president with the advice and consent of the Senate can form treaties and make foreign appointments. Now this clause today, we tend to think of the Senate as either a veto or a rubber stamp on whatever treaty the president has formed or whatever appointment the president has made. In 1789, when Washington took office, they fully anticipated that the Senate was going to serve as that Council of Foreign Affairs. That advice part, they meant quite literally. And the Senate seemed like maybe they would be safe advisors. They'd be good advisors because the states selected them. Presumably the states could be selected to pick wise and experienced men to advise the president. And if they gave bad advice, then the states could remove them. So this seemed like a really good system. Just a couple of months into Washington's presidency, he fully intended to use this option. He knew this was the expectation and he set up the first meeting with the Senate in August of 1789. He gave them some homework ahead of time, like a, like a good professor to make sure that the students were prepared. He gave them all of the existing treaties between the United States and Native American nations. He brought with him the acting Secretary of War, Henry Knox, who had helped with those treaties. And then he brought a list of questions that he wanted them to discuss and deliberate and provide some feedback on. These were his options, and he wanted to know what they thought about the various options. So on the day of the meeting, he arrived, he had an address, he had his questions, the address was read, the questions were read, and then he waited. And he was met with silence. Some of the senators sort of fiddled their papers and some kind of twiddled their thumbs. Strategies I'm sure none of you use to avoid being called on in class. Eventually, Senator William McClay of Pennsylvania stood up and said, this is a new subject for us. We would like to refer it to committee, discuss it privately, and can you please come back next week for our recommendation? Washington stood up and he said, this defeats every purpose of my being here, except much taller, much bigger, louder, angrier, and probably much scarier because he was the most famous man in the world and he was really furious with them. He did eventually calm down and he agreed to come back the following week, but on his way out, he reportedly said that he would never again return to the Senate for advice. And he didn't. 
Washington never went back, and since then, no president has ever gone back to the Senate for advice. So, just a couple of months into the presidency, this kind of huge element of the Constitution that the delegates had fairly carefully crafted had proven to be incredibly inefficient. If Washington needed to make an immediate decision about diplomacy and foreign policy, he couldn't wait for the Senate to debate about it for a while and get back to him when it was convenient for him. So he turned to the second option. Also in Article 2, it says the president may request advice from the executive departments in writing about subjects pertaining to their matters of expertise. Now, this clause was very carefully crafted as well. First of all, the president may request advice. He's not obligated to, and he's not obligated to follow it. Second, that advice is supposed to be in writing. And it's supposed to be in writing so that there is a, a map or um, a trail of evidence about who said what, who advocated which policy, who was in charge. They were trying to, to retain that transparency and that responsibility that they felt had been so desperately lacking in the British system. So Washington fully, again, expected to use this option. By the time the seat of government had moved to Philadelphia in 1790, he had been sending letters back and forth regularly with the department secretaries, but he realized that it was just, again, incredibly inefficient. So today, when we send text messages or WhatsApp or Signal or email, Sometimes things are not always clear. Maybe the tone doesn't come through as we intend. Maybe we forget to include the attachment, which I am guilty of. Maybe we forget to answer a question. And then pretty soon we're gonna have a bunch of messages or an email chain that's a mile long. Now imagine trying to do that with huge questions of state, huge questions of precedent and setting policy, and you're doing it with parchment and quill. You have to write out your letter, you have to wait for it to dry so it doesn't smudge. You have to wait for your clerk to deliver it to the recipient. And then you have to wait for that whole process to be returned. And then what happens if you have follow-up questions? It was a very slow, very inefficient process. And the subjects on the table were just too complex to do simply in writing. So Washington came up with a new system. He would send a letter. So there was a written record of what they were discussing. And then the secretary would come back with either a draft response or a draft proposal, but they would talk about it in person. They would have a one-on-one -on -one consultation to nail down any of the additional details or hammer out any questions. When Washington met with the secretaries, he typically met with them in his private study. Unfortunately, the house no longer exists, so this is sort of a 3D recreation of what that room would have looked like although I don't think it does a great job of capturing just how stuffed this room would have been. It kind of would have felt like a hoarder's room by 21st century standards because that desk in the corner was five feet wide. It would have been out from the wall because there were writing surfaces on both sides. There were at least three mahogany bookcases stuffed with books and papers, a stove in the corner, stove in the corner for warmth during the winter, the globe, Washington's uncommon chair, which is what he called it, and then a table and chairs for when the secretary came to meet with the president. This was a very private space. Only the secretaries had access to meet with Washington here. So this process worked, the one-on-one -on -one consultations and then the written correspondence for about two and a half years. Washington did not convene the first cabinet meeting until November 26, 1791, two and a half years into his presidency. So just for context, we're about a year and a half into President Biden's administration. Imagine him not meeting in person with his advisors as a group for a whole other year. That was how long Washington took to take this monumental step. I think he didn't, he didn't write why it took him so long, but my best guess is that he was reluctant to bring on comparisons to the British version. But he realized there were certain subjects, like the trade and diplomatic relationships between the United States, Great Britain, France, and Spain, which was the subject of the first cabinet meeting, that were simply too big and too complex to just get one opinion. He needed to have multiple advisors, multiple perspectives, especially when the questions touched on issues from multiple departments. So how does Washington, once he gets in this room with these people, so just in case these faces aren't familiar to you from left to right, 
We have President George Washington, uh, Secretary of War Henry Knox, Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, and Attorney General Edmund Randolph. Any fans of the musical Hamilton? Show of hands, please. Excellent. So for those of you who are familiar with the musical, you know that Hamilton and Jefferson despised each other. That was very accurately captured in the musical. They hated each other. I don't think they did their conversations in rap, but nonetheless, they were extremely intense and often quite nasty. Several years later, Jefferson referred to them as cockfights. So he's trying to bring up the um, visual spectacle of bloody like, you know, feathers flying, fighting to the death. So that was how he saw their conversations. So Washington was faced with this group of individuals who were very intelligent, very ambitious, sometimes pretty egotistical, always thought that they were right, and he had to manage this group. And he did so in a couple of ways. First, he always created a list of questions ahead of time to allow them to prepare, and then to use that list of questions for the meeting agenda. If they disagreed, which frankly was more often than not towards the end of Jefferson's time in the cabinet, he would ask for a written opinion afterwards. And the reason he did so was that first he could study all of the options. No one can remember everything right away. Make sure he made an informed choice, made sure he understood all of the details and the different positions to make sure that everyone felt that they were heard, that everyone felt as though they had had an opportunity to make their case and also, if he needed it, evidence about who said what and who advocated which policy. So just kind of want to walk through quickly a couple of key examples in the presidency about how the cabinet worked, how he used them efficiently and effectively, and why they mattered for Washington's presidency. So the first option took place in 1793. France declared war on Great Britain and it quickly spiraled into an international conflict known, and in the United States, it was known as the neutrality crisis because the United States was trying to stay out of this war. The US did not have an army or a navy, so even if it had wanted to fight, it had nothing to fight with, but it was just beginning to recover from the revolution and war made no sense. So Washington convened a cabinet meeting on April 18th. He gave them 13 questions and he said, what do we do? And over the next eight months, they met 51 times, up to five times per week, sometimes several hours per day. In that study that I showed you, in Philadelphia, most of those meetings took place in the summer without air conditioning, and Jefferson and Hamilton at this point were hardly on speaking terms. So you can imagine how fun those meetings would have been, how tense they would have been, and uh, not, not particularly my idea of a good time. Nonetheless, through that series of meetings, they came up with a couple of really important decisions. First, they came up with a list of rules of neutrality. Neutrality was brand new. If you declare it, which Washington did, you can see sort of the picture of the proclamation that was put in the newspapers. What happens if citizens ignore it? What happens if they decide to go fight? If you arrest them, what law are they breaking? What court is supposed to try that case? who is supposed to enforce any sort of penalty or punishment? These were just some of the questions that came up on the diplomatic side, or excuse me, on the domestic side. The diplomatic side was even more complicated because of the gentleman on the right. His name was Edmund Charles Genet. He was the new French minister to the United States, and he had his own set of ideas about how the U.S. should be operating during this war. And basically, he wanted them to be fighting in all but name. He ignored the proclamation. He set up basically a workshop to create privateers, which were private ships sailing under a license from a foreign nation to go attack British ships. The problem was that Genet's privateers were really, really good. So they would go out, they would capture a British ship, drag it back into the port of Philadelphia, deconstruct it, sell anything valuable, and turn it into a new privateer to continue the process. The port of Philadelphia was six blocks from the president's house, so needless to say, this did not go unnoticed by Washington and the other members of the cabinet. And the minister from Great Britain also lived in Philadelphia, so that did not go unnoticed by him either. So one of the big questions in the cabinet was what to do with Genet. 
Ultimately, after several sessions and negotiations, the cabinet decided to request the recall from France. And when France accepted it, that was again a really big precedent setting moment. But the reason this matters so much, the reason these cabinet meetings matter is first, Washington is trying to figure out all of these details about domestic policy, domestic law, international policy, foreign policy, relationships with different nations. And he needs that advice. The 51 meetings are quite intentional for a good reason. He wants the input. He also wants to make sure that they come to some sort of a compromise, which takes time when you have people like Jefferson and Hamilton who disagree on everything. They also helped him establish that the president has a sizable role in foreign policy. When all of this happened, Washington could have convened a session of Congress and said, we have an emergency, figure it out. Or we have an emergency, declare war. Or wait until Congress came back into session. Instead, Washington really took the lead with his cabinet's encouragement and approval and established an expectation that when foreign policy stuff happens, we expect the president to handle it. That's really because Washington set that expectation. A similar expectation was set the following year with domestic policy. A tax had been passed in 1792 that raised um, funds based on whiskey distilleries. It was very unpopular in the Western regions in particular. By 1794, the protests had turned violent. They burned down the house of a tax collector and Washington convened a series of cabinet meetings to figure out what to do. Again, he could have waited for Congress to come back in session. He could have convened an emergency session or he could have left it up to the states to decide. Instead, he decided to use a recently passed bill that allowed the president to send out militia troops in the event of a domestic insurrection which is exactly what he did with the cabinet's encouragement. And when he came back to Philadelphia, when the troops came back to Philadelphia, Congress didn't say anything. By not saying anything, Congress basically said, that's great, you dealt with it, we appreciate it, we can move on. And that established a precedent that the president has a very large role to play in domestic policy. In theory, that should be the states or Congress if we look at the Constitution. But Washington established the precedent that if there is an emergency, whether it's domestic or foreign policy, we look to the president. So towards the end of Washington's presidency, um, he established a really critical precedent for those that would follow. Uh, at the end of 1793, Thomas Jefferson retired. At the end of 1794, Henry Knox retired. At the end of January 1795, uh, Alexander Hamilton retired. And then that summer, Edmund Randolph resigned. So pretty quickly, Washington had turnover. He had these new appointees. I have affectionately dubbed them the B team because Washington didn't think very highly of them. He complained about their abilities. He had asked six other candidates before Timothy Pickering finally accepted the position for Secretary of State. And worse, Timothy Pickering knew that he was the president's seventh choice, which you can imagine how well that really endeared them to each other. So this was not a group that Washington particularly wanted to meet with, and so he didn't. Towards the end of his presidency, he only convened a couple of meetings and preferred really written correspondence or one-on-one -on -one conversations. And in doing so, he established that the cabinet does not have a right to be in the room where decisions are made. The cabinet does not have a right to be a part of the decision-making process. They can offer their opinion and the president can ask for it and the president can invite them in when it suits him and hopefully someday her, but they don't get to demand it. And so that means that this institution is very flexible. What works for a president might not work one year to the next. What works for one administration might not work for the next administration. So it's really up to the individual to decide who their closest advisors are going to be, how they're going to interact with them, how often they're going to meet with them, whether they're gonna take their advice at all. And so we've seen some presidents with really close relationships with their cabinets, or maybe one or two of their cabinet secretaries, some with terrible relationships, 
some that prefer advice from friends or family members or other staff or former colleagues or congressmen, and it's really up to whoever is in office. Now, obviously, that can go really well if you have a Lincoln or an FDR, and it can also go really badly if you have a Madison or a Harding who, for various different reasons, cannot manage the cabinet. So it's really a, an institution full of both promise and peril. So just a couple of examples of like how this actually works, the different styles, the different flexibility as we move past Washington. The cabinet on top is Thomas Jefferson's cabinet. He really learned from his experience with Washington and he had a remarkably effective cabinet. He had the least turnover of any president that has served two terms. And the way he did so was he almost never held cabinet meetings. He decided that he hated them and he thought they were super combative and super awful. And so the way he was gonna manage it is he was only gonna convene a cabinet meeting if he knew what they were gonna say and if they were gonna get along and if they were gonna be productive. Otherwise, he kept them apart because he thought that would be best for his administration. Ulysses S. Grant is on the bottom. Grant met with his cabinet quite often. Grant's cabinet kind of gets a bad rap because some of the corruption later on, which is a little bit deserved, but also the entire system was corrupt at that time, so it's not totally his fault. His cabinet, however, was, I think, responsible for his greatest moment as presidency, which was uh, his sending of national troops down south to protect suffrage and voting rights for uh, recently emancipated African Americans in the South. And so, and in doing so, he really crushed the KKK in South Carolina. And he did so because he listened to his attorney general. Had he not had a close relationship with that cabinet secretary, that wouldn't have happened. On the bottom right, we have Dwight Eisenhower. His cabinet was actually very similar to Grant's. Uh, he had very close relationships with a couple of his secretaries. He didn't really meet with them as a group like Grant did, but a couple in particular, including also his attorney general, gave him very good advice, which led to things like the enforcement of uh, Brown versus Board and the Little Rock Nine. So I mentioned how cabinets can go very badly. Uh, one of the ways that cabinets can go very badly is if they allow scandal or corruption to take over the cabinet. This was something that Washington was very careful to avoid. And when there was any hint of impropriety, he cut it off immediately. Now, this sounds kind of like a dub thing, like obviously you want to avoid scandal, but it's not as obvious as it sounds. So the top was Andrew Jackson. He went through three full cabinets before he could find a group who would do whatever he wanted, including his first cabinet, he refused to speak with for over a year because they would not socialize with one of the wives of the cabinet secretaries who was reportedly a woman of ill repute. And Jackson demanded that they all socialize. They said no, and so he refused to talk to them for a year. I don't think that that's necessarily how one should govern because the newspapers were obsessed with what they called the petticoat affair for that entire year. But nonetheless, this is a caution story. On the bottom left, we have James Monroe, who actually had a pretty good cabinet his first term. His second term, when it was clear he was not going to run again, descended into chaos because every single person in it was running to replace him. So those cabinet meetings probably weren't very fun. Bottom right is Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson's cabinet led to his impeachment. Whenever that happens and really forms your legacy, your cabinet has gone awry. So the last thing that I want to encourage us to think about in terms of Washington's cabinet and how that has shaped presidencies since then is diversity. Now, when we look at this group, we think this is a group of five white guys. And you would not be wrong, they are five white guys. However, Washington's contemporaries looked at this group and understood that at the time, only white propertied men counted as citizens. And so this group was actually very diverse. They came from different geographic regions. They represented different educational, uh, religious, cultural, economic traditions and factions. They represented different parts of the American experience. And they were a way for Washington to try and bring together the new nation at a time when there were very few emotional ties between the American people and the federal government. This was an example that his contemporaries understood and embraced. And I would argue that the best presidents have followed. The cabinet is an amazing opportunity to pull together political coalitions, to make different types of American people feel heard, 
and also to get the best and diverse types of advice because studies have shown that diverse groups make better decisions. So good presidents are willing to surround themselves with a lot of different ideas. Obviously our concept of diversity has expanded over time, has changed over time. And I would argue that cabinet representation actually goes kind of in lockstep with our concept of who counts as a citizen. So a few examples, Abraham Lincoln up top on the right was the first president to have a cabinet secretary west of the Mississippi. So geographic representation was really important, especially at a time when he was trying to hold the union together. Top left is Franklin D. Roosevelt. He was the first president to have a female cabinet secretary. Frances Perkins was his secretary of labor, the longest serving and I would argue most influential secretary of labor in US history. And until President Biden's administration, President Obama had the most diverse cabinet um, up until that point. So the concept of diversity and representation in the cabinet has continued to expand. Lastly, and this is something that is sort of new to me as I, I've been talking about Washington for several years, but as I'm starting to think about Adams and frankly, in light of, the, uh, of our current events the last couple of years, I've started to think a little bit more about the transition process. I'm sure all of you read about the farewell address in your high school textbooks. Uh, it is typically included in our curriculum, and I think rightly so, it's a very important and very prescient document. It warns against allowing our political uh, allegiances to come between us as citizens, and it warns against foreign interference in domestic affairs. These are things we absolutely have to pay attention to today. But what I think is actually so remarkable is that Washington published this address, made the decision to retire, not, not because he was stepping away from power, which he, he was, of course, but I think the more important goal was to ensure that the transition process, the election process took place while he was still alive, took place while he was there to sort of oversee it, to lend legitimacy to it, to give it his stamp of approval. Because Americans had never done that before. It was new, it was very scary, uh, I, 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 um, I don't know, actually, I don't think I showed a picture, but their, their most recent transition that they had observed was the French Revolution just a couple of years prior, which was incredibly bloody, incredibly violent. It was characterized by guillotines in the streets. So they were eager to try and avoid this process. And Washington knew that it had to be learned. And it, it had to be learned in all of the ways that one learns how to have multiple presidents. And I wanted to show these two portraits as an example. The portrait on, on your right is Washington's famous presidential portrait. It was painted during his presidency. The portrait on the left was the portrait of John Adams that was painted his first year in office. That's not what John Adams looks like, just so we're clear. If you look at any other portrait, that looks nothing like him at the time. What the artist basically did was copied and pasted Washington's sort of entire setup, the, the curtains, the desk, the books, the pose, the sword, even to a certain extent, the body, and then just put Adam's head on top. Because Americans didn't know how to visualize anyone but Washington being president. And they all, and, and Adams and Washington knew it and knew that they had to figure out how that would work. So that I think is the most revolutionary moment actually of Washington's presidency. One we typically take for granted, or at least I did until last year, and one that they very much did not take for granted. So I'm continuing to explore that in my next book. Very excited to share that when the time comes. Um, and now I would really love to take a couple of questions. We have about 11 minutes. So if I can answer some questions, I'd love to, to do so for you. All right, is your hand raised? No, okay. <laughs> Yes. It's a great question. So most of the people who attended the Constitutional Convention left saying like, meh, like it was Washington wrote these letters basically saying it was the best that could be had at the moment. I didn't get everything I wanted. No one got everything they wanted. It was a lot of compromise. I hope that continual 
uh, evolution and, and uh, new solutions are constantly proposed and adopted. And from the very beginning, they were trying to figure out how to implement it. Uh, notice, if anyone has viewed the Constitution recently, the Bill of Rights was not in there when it was first ratified. The judicial system was not in there. Um, and the executive departments are not in there. So in the very first summer, Congress had to do all of those things, which no Congress has ever been more effective, I should say, to be able to do all of those things in just a couple of months. But so what that means is they were very aware that the, the Constitution was a starting place and was a um, something that had to be built on and all the fuzzy bits kind of had to be fleshed out by those that were actually in office. And I think one of the reasons that Article 2 is so short is because they trusted Washington to do so. They trusted him to make good decisions, which frankly was a little bit of a gamble to trust someone to make good choices and like figure out what an institution actually would be. Um, and so I think that they were sort of content to allow him to make those choices. And what's remarkable is that for all of this fear about the cabinet, for all of this fear about the British version, there weren't really any complaints. People criticized Hamilton for looking sometimes too much like British ministers, but they didn't ever criticize the institution, which I think is really incredible. Great question, thank you. Yes. Yeah, it's a good punchy question. Um, I love it. So I think, frankly, they would be shocked that we still actually have the Constitution. Adams thought we'd be lucky if it lasted 10 years. Jefferson was a little bit more optimistic and said that maybe it could be replaced every 19. So the concept that this thing that they thought was very much imperfect and still a work in progress would still be in existence would be shocking to them. I think Frankly, they would be disappointed in the generations that followed that, that we hadn't tried to come up with more creative solutions to the problems that face us, whether that's improving the amendment process so that we can retain the initial institution, but continue to improve it to address things that they could not have even possibly considered. I mean, like if they saw airplanes, they would be like, what the heck is this steel tube doing in our skies? So I think that the world that we live in is so unfathomable to them. They, I don't know that they necessarily would say that it should be a living document, but they would say we should not accept a document that doesn't work for us just because we've had it for a really long time. So whether that's reform, whether that's amendments, whether that's interpreting it differently, I don't think that they would dictate that, but they would not want us to be impotent in the face of real challenges and real threats. Yes. Yeah, that's great. So we are certainly living in a very intense partisan time, and it's, it's not the first. I mean, the 1790s were quite vicious and quite awful, and uh, John Adams critics called him, said he had a hermaphroditic um, character, meaning he had like no principles and values. Jefferson's critics said that he was going to come steal all of your Bibles and burn them. So I mean, like they were, you know, they were not subtle uh, with their criticisms. Um, my favorite is that people said that Adams was controlled by a cabinet of one, meeting his wife, which was supposed to be a real insult because if he wasn't man enough to control his wife, he wasn't going to be able to control the country. Of course, they were kind of right. He did have a cabinet of one and she was his best advisor and probably should be because she was way smarter than some of the other ones, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so I think that the, what worked for Washington, being able to hold those different perspectives in place generally doesn't work for most presidents because you need to have people who are working towards the same goal for you in your cabinet. There are a couple of examples in history where there's been really good bipartisan options. So my favorite is FDR. In his third and fourth terms, he replaced the Democratic secretaries in positions like War and Navy because he knew the United States was going to be going into World War II. And he appointed former cabinet secretaries from the Coolidge and Hoover administrations. So died in the wool Republicans. They agreed on no social policy. They agreed on no economic policy, but they agreed on how to fight the war. And so they could work on that one thing and it wouldn't be a distraction. 
if presidents can find people to appoint that are bipartisan that can work on one thing together, then that's great. But if you're appointing someone from the opposite party just to have the bipartisan box to check and there's not actually a way to work together, then it's just an obstacle towards good administration. So obviously in this particular moment, when the party lines are really quite intense, it would be very hard to do. Do we have time for one more? One more question? Yes. Great question. I do think it has. So um, I think there are a lot of factors that have led to the fact that Congress has basically, in a lot of ways, abdicated its authority and its responsibilities to the executive branch. So I don't want to say this is the only reason, but Congress is supposed to play a pretty intense role in a lot of a lot of elements. And it may, maybe it made a little bit more sense in 1789 when only 22 senators were seated. 22 is a little bit easier to get advice from than 100. Uh, I wouldn't particularly want to get advice from 100 people either, so I get that. Um, but you know, foreign policy is supposed to have some give and take with the Senate. And the point is that there is oversight, there, is, um, there, is, there are restrictions and limitations on what the president can do. And I think that at various times, the Senate has been better about using that oversight ability, whether it's through committees or um, briefings. but. For the most part now, the president has a pretty free hand to do things, obviously with the advice and guidance of state and military, things like that. But Congress doesn't really play a role, and I think that's a mistake.